Welcome to Wine and Dine Radio. I'm Lynn Crelo Chamberlain. Hi there, this is Andreas Larson. Hi, this is John Capon. My name is Mathur Jaffrey. Hi, my name is Heike Platter. I'm from the Alto Adige region or Sud Tyrol. Hi, my name is Paul Dolan. I am absolutely passionate about growing organic and biodynamic fruit for our wines. Hello, my name is Lorena Garcia. Hello, my name is Fritz Maytag. This is Joyce Bach. I'm the author of Foodie Fight. Hi, this is Lydia Mandave, founder of 29 Cosmetics. Cheers, this is Rob Barnett, CEO and founder of VinVillage.com, where wine lovers connect. Well, today this segment on Wine and Dine is dedicated to Burgundy lovers around the world. And let's also couch this in, if you happen to be someone who is really, really irritated with a business that is unethical, lacks integrity, and all at the expense of trying to increase their bottom line and therefore hurt not only their own reputation, but the reputation of a region, then you will find our conversation very, very interesting with Jeff Lotman, who is the CEO of Global Icons. Global Icons is a leading corporate brand licensing and marketing agency. And he is joining us today, not only as a longtime collector and lover of wines, but also he's going to talk to us about this recent scandal surrounding Maison Labrie Roi vineyards that in, who intentionally mislabeled vintages and how, per, and really we welcome your comments. So please uh, send your comments our way, how he thinks it will impact the brand reputation of winemakers throughout the entire Burgundy region. And Jeff, thank you so very much for joining us today. How many Burgundy wines do you have in your over 4,000 bottle cellar? Um, a fair amount of Burgundies. I mean, it's something that I really enjoy. I have to admit that I've become more of a, a, Pinot, a California Pinot Noir drinker since moving out here 15 years ago. Oh, wow. But I still definitely, uh, I still definitely love my Burgundies. And, and where are you originally from in the East Coast? I'm a Philadelphia guy, born and raised. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay, so, so talk to us about the importance of ba- really integrity in, in brand marketing. Well, the great thing about brands is it really allows you to trust a product. And when you're talking about a product that you consume, it's actually a higher level of trust because you're actually drinking this wine and you're really believing that it is what it is. And the great thing is, I mean, look, I'm not an expert dr- wine drinker and I can't necessarily in blind taste testing tell you which is an 03 versus an 04 or an 05. So a lot of it is that you have to believe the the people that you trust who are your advisors, the Robert Parker or Tanzer or whoever, as these are great wines. Some of it obviously is what you like, but at the same idea, you also believe that what's in the bottle is what's in the bottle. And right. now to find out that may not be the case, that's scary. Oh, that's so scary. And it, it almost uh, is, it, uh, all of a sudden I had this flash memory of Taco Bell that was uh, got in trouble for its meat or ground meat not being entirely ground meat. Sure, or the whole Tylenol scare, <laughs> which still, you know, was, even though it wasn't their fault, people lost trust in, in the product because, again, it's something that you consumed. It's not like you're buying a T-shirt yeah. and you find out it's not necessarily made where they say it was. It's not that big of an issue. Wow. So, okay, so, uh, and, I, and I have not read the, all the details on this mislabeling of vintages, but what do you think is going to happen for, or do you think that this is even going to have an impact on that some of the producers are, are fighting this negative ish, reputation or image, and, and perhaps this will be something that will haunt them for many years to come? Well, I think it's going to. I think even if you back up a little bit besides what has just recently happened, you look at what's been going on in the very high-end auctions, and there's been all these fakes coming out. Yes. Let's face it. When you're talking about buying a bottle of Petrus for you know, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 a bottle, you know, it's an easy thing to fake. You know, you buy an old bottle, you relabel it, or you take a bottle of Petrus that's already been drank, you steam the label off, and you put it on one that hasn't been opened. It's pretty hard to tell. And, I mean, they can make a great Louis Vuitton bag. Someone can surely make a bottle of Petrus. Oh, gosh. it's so. It's a, to me, what's scarier than anything is just that there are people who actually spend their energy trying to... Uh, uh, to commit all this fraud, perpetrate this fraud. I don't understand why people put their energies into negative things like that. 
Well, unfortunately, I guess it's because people are willing to spend money on something, and not everyone really knows the difference. And and that's why the brands really yeah. matter. And getting back to what just happened is that, you know, how are you really going to know the difference? I mean, here you have a winemaker who obviously is very well respected, makes a great wine, and then realizes that they have a ton of juice from one year that hasn't exactly sold, and they don't have any juice from this year that everybody wants, and they just label uh, more. Oh, so it was actually the winemaker who made this deci- this decision to do the mislabel the vintages. Oh yes, that's what makes it so. That's what oh. really makes it bad. Yes, he he actually he made the decision that you know what everyone wants, and I forget which is the which is the one they wanted and which is the one they relabeled. But everyone wanted one year, and we have all this stuff that nobody wanted. Why don't we relabel it? And because of the oh. way wine is actually sold in Europe, which is something I only learned recently is that it's not labeled to the very last moment. It's actually in the boxes, unlabeled, because if you think about it, if it's going to Germany or if it's going to the United States or if it's going to China, there's different labeling requirements that are needed for each one of those governments. So because of it, they're not even stickered to the very last minute. So you have cases and cases of bottles that are unlabeled sitting in a warehouse. So it's not that hard even to... You're not, re, you're not even relabeling it. You're labeling it the first time and using the wrong labels purposely because that's what everybody wants. That's the part oh. that... It just blew me away. Wow. I bet you their sales have just, you know, just di- nosedived. It has to. And, and it also affects the rest of the industry because, let's face it, these are a real player. And, you know, what keeps other people from doing that? And what keeps other people from doing that in the past? And except for... These guys reporting internally that this is the right way and here's our inventory. Well, guess what? They had been cited in the past of doing some minor infractions, oh, and clearly really? they, they knew what they were doing. Oh, the same winery has been, been trouble before. Yes. Oh, my gosh. So who the heck blew the whistle on them? How, how, were they dis- how was this discovered? You know, I'm not really sure of those details, but from what I understand, that there is some accounting that actually goes on, and they there is a board that actually checks it. And in the process of doing the checking, they started realizing these numbers were not adding up, and that okay. because everyone's allowed a certain amount of you know breakage and you know bottles get lost or the corks get damaged, but there was an inordinate amount of wine that basically oh. they had much more. They were able to produce much more bottles than the amount of fruit they had. So clearly yeah, something yeah. was going on. Yes. Um, and you just can't add you know, water when you're topping off the barrel. I mean, clearly something's happening, and that's when they realize that they're taking you know, O3s and labeling those O5s or vice versa. Is this something that, that, that oh, and I'm, I'm so bad, and in, 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 I'm, I'm embarrassed in admitting this, but uh, I don't subscribe to all the wine news letter, newspapers and all that, so I'm not exactly sure the timeline. Is this something that happened in 2012? Well, I think it was just recently discovered is what it was. I think this is older okay. wine that, that has already been shipped and but, in the marketplace. But recently discovered. Yes, it was very recently discovered. It was um, it finally broke. Uh, it was in June or July. I mean, it's, it's only a month ago or six weeks ago this whole story broke. Oh, my gosh. So how how can, let's say, not the brand La Roi, but the brand Burgundy reestablish faith for if the consumer? You know, you, you have a really good question, and I think it has to start with that exact point, because the industry has to say, you know, we're not going to let this happen, and we want to let consumers know that when they buy a Burgundy, that they're getting a Burgundy. That's why you get, you know, the French fighting saying, you know, you can only call something champagne if it comes from Champagne region. You can't, that's why the rest of us all call it sparkling wine, but let's face it, it is what we all believe to be champagne. It is because those things really matter, and for something to be called Burgundy, you know, not only does it have to come from the region, but then has to follow certain procedures. Right. So right. they almost have to go and look at some sort of an additional label, which is like one of these. You see a lot of these holographic labels used in a lot of industry that really prove um, what it is and also what the number is. So it actually can state, as in some of the wines in California, a lot of them do. It actually shows that this is bottle number, blah blah blah, oh, out yeah. of X amount of bottles. Yeah. And I think if that, because that label can go on every bottle separate from the additional labeling that we're talking that has to happen from individual countries requirements. Uh-huh. So if they do that then you know that what's in that case and what's in that bottle is a 04 such and such because it's on the label and that can't be changed. I would uh, imagine that uh, this is since and I and I do remember hearing in the last 20 or 12 months or so that a uh, big fraud going on in with a couple issues in auction. And it really kind of, a lot of the responsibility falls on the auction house uh, shoulders to prove that, uh, uh, or somehow there has to be a faith 
that the wine is authentic. What is in what it says on the label is what's in the bottle. Yeah, they they try really hard to authenticate it. Um, and let's face it, I mean, some people just get really good at, I mean, faking things. There's been fakes oh. that have gone at auction of you know old master paintings too. But I think a lot of it comes down to when they know that they're buying from a great seller and someone yeah. who's had something for a long time. And especially if a guy that's been who has verticals, if if a guy has a vertical of something, the odds are high that one of whatever the one that you're buying out of that vertical is going to be fine because he obviously has been on the list and has been buying it every year. Yeah. I would think the odds of that being a fake is pretty small. But when you're just buying a random case of something, again, unless you really know its history, you don't really know. I mean, it's I mean, you could take another case that someone already drank and put away and saved it, and they went ahead and they recorked it. I mean, you don't really know. It's the same case. It's the same label. It's the same bottle. And they put an old wine from 61, but it's not a fantastic wine. And you put it, you know, you recork it, you, and all they're doing is making the capsule, and you're off to the races. Oh, gosh, yes. I, I just don't, there's so much at stake, reputation-wise. It just, it defies logic that someone would, would, would potentially totally ruin their reputation by doing something like that, especially the serious of Maison Labre Roy. They're a big, big, serious name in that Burgundy. Is that, right. I mean, it's a different story if you're talking about random people trying to rip people off because they're making fakes. That's, okay, you, you may not like it, but you get where that happens, but that's more of an individual basis. But when you're talking about a winery of the size that these guys are and the reputation and the quality, it, it's actually shocking, and that's why I think it really caught everybody by storm because they're like, wait a minute, if these guys do it, who else, you have to oh, ask yeah. yourself, who else is doing this? Is this yeah. maybe what's been going on for a while? And these are the guys that got caught. Wow. Jeff Lottman, CEO of Global Icons, thank you so very much for joining us today on Wine and Dine. 